Chapter 8, Embryology and Histology. Uh, we're going to look at the three prenatal phases. Conception through the first two weeks is the zygote. Two weeks through the eighth week is the embryo. Nine weeks through birth is the fetus. Your objectives for this chapter are to identify the terms and times of the three prenatal phases of pregnancy, describe the life cycle of the tooth and identify the stages, identify the substances of enamel, dentin, cementum, and pulp, and their identifying marks. And describe the structures of gingiva and mucosa. Um, so we've gone over these three, and why do you think it's important that we know these three phases? Well, um, if you're taking dental x-rays, they say that the third and final phase of pregnancy, the baby is fine um, once you, know, you get into your third trimester to take dental x-rays. But in our office, we always erred on caution, and if anybody was pregnant, whether it was day one or the day before delivery, we did not do anything because of um, the fact that it could cause developmental disturbances. So here are the, the different stages of what we call differentiation. Cyto refers to cells. So you have cytodifferentiation, and that's the development of different cells. Histo refers to tissue, and so we have histodifferentiation, the development of different tissues. Uh, morpho is changing shapes, and you've seen in um, the mighty Morphin Power Rangers, um, they're called that because they change shape. So you have the morpho, differentiation, the development of different forms. Developmental disturbances, most disturbances occur during the embryonic period, but may occur any time, uh, depending on if mom's on medication, um, there's an accident, there's you know exposure to high doses of radiation. Um, genetic and environmental factors such as drugs, infections can initiate malformations in the unborn child. Women should not use alcohol or drugs when they find out they are pregnant, or at all for that matter. This is a child with FAS, which stands for fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, this syndrome includes a small head circumference, a low nasal bridge, indistinct philtrum, thin upper lip, and a small mandible. A cleft lip is unilateral, which means one side, uni means one. Bi means two, so you'd have bilateral means both sides of the lip. And this is more common in boys than girls. A cleft palate is the failure of the palatal shelves to fuse with the primary palate or with each other. It may or may not happen with a cleft lip. So you could have a cleft palate and not a cleft lip and vice versa. Um, a cleft uvula is the mildest form of a cleft palate because it does not disturb eating or speaking to the same degree as a cleft palate or a lip. And so here you see a little boy that has a uh, cleft lip and um, he also had cleft palate. And you can see here how the nostril is lower. So this would be on his left side. And this is how it affects an infant when they're born. They have trouble swallowing, um, you know, drinking their, their bottle, latching on. Um, and so they have to go through many, many surgeries to correct this at different stages in their life. Um, the life cycle of a tooth, you have the bud stage, which is the first stage where the growths are initiated. Uh, the cap stage is where the bud begins to change shape. Bell stage is where histo differentiation begins, the enamel forming cells that start forming. Maturation stage, layers begin to form such as enamel, 
dentin and cementum. Histology is the study of microscopic structures and functions of tissues. Again, there's that histo meaning tissue and then ology, so histology. Oral histology is the study of tissues of the teeth and the structures of the oral cavity that surround the teeth. And so when you're a dental lab technician, uh, we've gone in the lab, we've gone in the clinic a couple of times. Um, when you take that impression and you pour it up, if you're making a crown, you need to understand the tooth structure as well as um, the different parts of the teeth, such as the, the pits, the fissures, the structure of the cusp. Also, it can fit together with the lower part of the teeth. So when they go into occlusion, you've got to understand this tooth structure. Um, the enamel covers the outside of the tooth. The dentin makes up the bulk of the tooth, which is underneath the enamel. Um, and it's normally not visible. Some things that might cause it to be visible, if your tooth breaks off, if you wear your teeth down from grinding, um, sometimes just over time, getting older from chewing, you wear down your teeth, and it's not that white enamel you see, it's that yellowish dentin you see. Um, and then the, the third layer is the cementum, and it's located around the root. So if you think of this in the terms of the earth, you have the crust, mantle, and core. A lot of things um, in science you see are in layers like this. And so um, the crust would be the outer, harder surface, which is your enamel. The dentin would be um, the mantle, which makes up a bulk of, of the earth. And then you have the cementum, um, which kind of encompasses everything. Um, from the center of the earth, that is the liquid part, and the pulp um, contains that tissue and blood and nerves. And a lot of people will say, I don't go to the dentist until I'm in pain. Well, by the time it reaches the very center, the pulp, um, that is too late. Once that hurts, um, you know, you've damaged nerve and tissue and you're not gonna have um, a healthy tooth to be able to put a filling in. It's gonna have to be pulled or you're gonna have to get a root canal. And so here you can see the different levels. You have your crown, the enamel, the dentin, the pulp cavity, the cementum, the root canal. Um, and the root canal holds all of those nerves, blood, tissue, and in order to quote unquote save the tooth to keep it from getting extracted, you can't just leave dead tissue in the body. So you have to clean out that pulp chamber and fill it with something, because if not, gases are gonna build up in there and it's gonna create pressure, which is gonna create pain. It's just like if your body has natural gas and the only way to relieve it is by passing gas, there's nowhere for it to go, it gets trapped. So the only way to do that is to go through the enamel, the dentin until you reach the pulp with a burr and tunnel down in there to release that gas. Then you have to pack all of that canal once it's cleaned out with gutta percha so that it will be filled and gas can't get up in there and build up. Here is a, a picture of a little boy that was born with cleft lip and palate. And you can see here how his, his nose did not uh, form together right here to um, complete that nostril on both sides. So here you have his centrals and where are the other teeth, do you think? Missing? All right, they're up in his palate. And so when you're reconstructing this, it's gonna to have to go in different phases of surgery. You're gonna have a team of doctors get together and strategize and plan, not just for functional, but also the plastic surgery part, um, and, and to, to make as minimal cuts 
and minimal trauma to the tissue as possible uh, so you don't have bad scarring uh, buildup. So you can see here how um, the teeth are further up. Right here you can see the root. Um, and with orthodontics, you know, this can all be fixed. Um, so you're gonna have a surgical team with an orthodontist, the oral surgeon, a plastic surgeon, um, depending on the age, you know, you're gonna have to include the pediatrician. And so all of these things have to be, um, you know, discussed and, and strategized. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts. This is something you're going to hear a lot about in many of the chapters we cover, especially orthodontics. So osteoblasts are bone forming cells. So if you take a tooth and you're pushing it through the alveolar bone to straighten it, it's going to leave a gap behind it and it's going to push against that bone to resorb it and recede it like a receding hairline. Osteoclasts are the cells that resorb the bone so it can continue going forward. It kind of makes a path for it. Osteoblasts, once that tooth is moved and there's an empty space where it once was, the bone forming cells fill in. That's why a lot of people say, well, why can't I come back every week and get my braces changed and get my wires tightened? Well, you have to allow time for the bone forming cells to fill in that space. If not, you're gonna just keep moving and that root is just gonna burn. It's gonna resorb so much that your teeth are not gonna have any stability and you're gonna to have to get, um, well, the teeth will get loose and they'll eventually come out because you have to have the root stability. And so, if that happens, it's kind of pointless to even get braces in the first place. So in about six to eight weeks, <clears throat> these osteoblasts form, everything kind of gets settled again, and then you're ready for your next wire, okay? Um, but when you're doing something like an impacted canine, and you have to um, expose the gum, expose the tissue, expose the tooth, put one of the buttons with the chain on it, you slowly drag that down so that it comes into occlusion. You know, the osteoblast and osteoclast are both working together, okay? All right, um, so there you have repair of the nasal floor. You know, everything has been cleaned out and they're gonna go in and pack it with again, osteoblast bone forming cells to repair that. Uh, in here, you see retractors, those silver things. Those are retractors, they're called Minnesota retractors. And you'll use those in general dentistry, um, oral surgery, you know, lots of different procedures, okay? Any questions? <clears throat>